Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. This is one of the boards that was donated to me recently. Uh, I think it came from all the way from uh, Denmark, actually, from uh, this chap over here. I forget the name of him, I'm useless at remembering names. Um, but uh, this is absolutely brilliant because this is a Rev3 board. I'll give you a, a, a quick scan over the board in a minute. Uh, we'll hover over some of the differences and things. I'll point some of the differences. I mean, the first thing you can see, perhaps down here, is the crystal. The crystal's down here. That, that's the clue that gives it away that this is a Rev3. Um, so I was just about to test this uh, to see what it's doing or not doing. And do you know what I've just noticed? The pin one notch is there, and the pin one marking is down here. So that Agnes is, and there's a pin bent there. So this Agnes is not in here, correct? So uh, I'm just going to disconnect the power just to make sure we don't uh, have power. We'll use the PLCC extractor here. Now we might end up scratching the chip. There we go. We haven't. It's pulled off okay. Uh, let's just inspect the pins around there. Yeah, they're looking okay. Let's just sit that there a sec. I'm going to just get a sharp tool, I think, try and fix that pin if I can, straighten out a little bit. But then we'll get the chip in properly and see if that makes any difference. Yeah, I'm not sure what's happened to that pin there, but it's still not doing anything. No video display at all. It's not even switching the TV onto the right uh, channel there. So uh, I think I'm just going to do the obvious things. Measure voltages. And I'll get the uh, logic probe, we'll check the CPU clock, I think. Yeah, so my first uh, thoughts here, I think it's a voltage issue. Uh, I'm just going to connect the ground, there's lots of the tamps, I'll show you one of them in a sec. The shield, you know, ground tamps, it's like one down here. Um, and if we just measure that pin there, you know, the uppermost, the maximum pin on these TTL chips here, you can see we're getting 0 0.07 something. Let me just switch the switch I think that's on there I think it was off let's just try that again look at that 1.8 volts and rising so something somewhere will be getting super hot and uh, I'm not sure what but something somewhere will be getting super hot and eating that voltage it's going to be one of the smaller components somewhere yeah because nothing none of the main ICs are warm so that is super interesting actually um, so I think the next thing I'll do is just uh, have a look at the underside of here just to make sure that's okay yeah for ground I was using one of these ground points here you can use those for the negative on your multimeter probe but if we uh, just measure the voltage here we're on volts DC and just measure the pins these are underneath the socket so that's 12 volts minus 12 volts 5 volts, now we ain't seeing that on the board on any of the chips, so 5 volts there, minus 12, plus 12, so that's very interesting actually. And by the way, that was the choke we were measuring on there, so the supply is coming through from here through the choke. I don't understand why any of the chips um, are not showing any voltage, we must have a broken trace somewhere very near here. Well, you know what? This is super strange. Let me just zoom you in. So our 5 volt rail comes out of there to here. It's been cut. There's a cut, a physical cut in the board there, and then there's a bit of solder here. So that is very odd, to say the least. I think there's a break up here as well. The trace being cut there. So it's had some sort of mod done to it, this board. Now I've got another one of these boards which I'll show you later, it might be within this video, but I'm just going to have another look at that board just to make sure that's not being modded the same way and this is some sort of factory mod, but I'm suspecting the 5 volts is not getting to where it needs to be because of that break there actually. Yeah, it's a factory mod, I'm glad I had the uh, thought to check that, because you can see here we've got a cut there, and then we've got that bit that was soldered on the other board there, but it's bridged across to here. This is how um, you know the revision has been done. So for whatever reason, this rail here has been cut out. There might be something on there that's not right. Maybe it's just that connection to that pin there. Um, yeah, but that's uh, that needs to be in place. So I think we need to put a bridge um, like this one has here, I think. So as you can see, I've got a piece of wire here. I've just uh, stripped the end off. I'll just tin that up. I'm not sure if the soldering ends uh, going to be hot enough yet. Yeah, it's just about there, I think. So yeah, we'll just uh, tin that up. And uh, we'll add a little bit of solder to that bit there. 
a little bit of solder on that pin. What I'm not sure about is why is it being removed? Because clearly it's, uh, well it looks like a factory mod, unless someone's tried to do the same mod to two different boards here and failed, I don't know. It's uh, interesting to say the least, let's solder that there. And we'll just pull this across and heat that there, there we go, that'll do. Bring the cutters in and just trim that there. So let's go and give that a try and see what happens. So as I'll show you, the pads that look like the grounds, they're not grounds on that early Rev3 board. So the voltage is actually getting across now. Um, I mean, I didn't need to do that mod, you know, on the underside, sort of up in that area. This is a Rev6A board here. I'm testing the 8372A on here. So, you know, you'll know it was in the wrong way around on that other socket. Still not doing anything. So I thought, well, let's just rule the Agnes out in case any damage has occurred. And it hasn't. I'll point you at the screen in a minute. It's working. I'm also testing the ROM just to rule those two chips out all in one. But as you can see, that is working. So the good news is, even though the Agnes was in the wrong way around in the socket, that hasn't killed it. Uh, now I swapped to the CIA's round, still made no difference, still getting no video. If I connect composite up, this is sorry, this is a 6A board by the way. Uh, if I connect composite up, uh, as you'll see, we just get a black screen. It takes a few seconds for it to appear, but you do get a black screen. So I'm going to just work my way around a couple of the chips here. I'll swap out the Denise from this board, this working 6A here, onto the board. See if that makes a difference, then do the same with Paula, then do the same with Gary. Just to rule those out. So with composite, you will see it takes a few seconds to come on, but we do get just a black screen. So I switched that off. Um, yeah, so we know the ROM on here is okay, the Agnes on here is okay, unless the socket is the issue. Maybe the socket's not making a good connection, but... Anyway, I'm going to swap out the Denise next, let's try that. So let's try that with a different Denise, one that I know works. Same thing, so it's not Denise. So, I'm just swapping out Paula. Ah, some corrosion in the Paula pins actually, in the socket. Doesn't look very clean anyway, let's just try that. Just the same. There are a couple of, like I say, dirty uh, socket pins there, but it's still not booting. Let's try Gary. So, through process of elimination, I've worked out that one of the CIAs is faulty. This one, you can see it already had a D on it, which may indicate that has been tested and faulty. Um, the easy way to test on boot is in this slot here. You know, if you've got an unworking CIA here, generally you'll, you'll find it won't boot, and it wasn't. It was getting stuck on like a dark grey screen. But as you can see, that's coming up, despite the fact we've got the even CIA missing at the moment. So all I did is I took the one out that was out the even CIA there, put it into the odd to get it to boot up. So we've got one faulty CIA, but that's not causing the thing to black screen on the other board. So it's only half the problem. I'll test the other board again now with two known working CIAs. But that then means that all of the socket chips aside from the CPU have been tested. So my guess here is this is crashing early in the boot process. I think that's what's going on. And I think it's going to be something killing the data bus. I think it's going to be these 244s. Uh, I mean, if I look at the, uh, I think the control signals, you know, the select signals here, that's high. And I think the one on the other side, that's high. So nothing will be passing through that. But I suspect that that's perhaps enabled when it shouldn't be doing. We've got some, you know, stuck data bit. It's like a look at the CPU here, that's a data pin, it's low, the next one's high, low, 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 high, high. I think there's only four there that are data bits actually, I think the remainder are over here. So that's pulsing, no it's not, it's high, low, high, low, high, low. So, yeah, it's very strange this. Nothing's getting hot or anything like that. Aren't these address bits up here? Why are they all floating? Might just try a different CPU actually, just to rule the CPU out. So I could be wrong with this, you know, I've tested all the chips here and I've had a good probe around. I saw some stuck data bits and things, I'm not seeing much activity on Paul, or there's lots of pins that are just high impedance. Same with the Gary, you know, pins up here, probably presumably some sort of data bus on it or something. Um, but I'm thinking, you know, coming back to this again, I'm thinking it's this uh, pin here because the bottom of these are all protruding in order to make contact with the chip apart from that one. It's pressed in at the bottom and it's kind of raised to the top. 
So I mean I could swap the socket out, but in the first instance I'm just going to try and get the uh, probe somehow underneath it and just see if we can prise it out a bit at the bottom and just reseat it, see if that makes a difference. So I took the decision to take the Agnes socket off because uh, it wasn't just that one pin, all the other pins they just seem to have been depressed, you know, pressed back a little bit so that when, you, when the chip's in there many of them are just not making a connection with the uh, pins on the chip as they should do. As you can see I'm just using the desolder pump here. I like to do this sort of thing from time to time, I just find it therapeutic uh, rather than trying to use the desolder station. Sometimes you just need to add a little bit of solder uh, and flux. What's going on there? Uh, yeah, sometimes you need to add a little bit of solder and flux before it'll free up, as you can see. Uh, anyway, we'll just keep going around here until I've got all the solder off. And I'll snap the pins off the edges with the pliers, I'll show you. And we'll see if we can get this uh, socket off. I might be able to fix the pins, I don't know, once it's off. It's, as it is at the moment, it's really difficult trying to gain access at the right angle to try and straighten the one or two pins out that are bent and I bent one myself even worse than the one that was already bent but just like I said just looking at the profile along the, the edge and the bottom you can see that many of the pins are not going to be making a very good connection at all so most of the solder is freed up there I just need to uh, just do a bit of this and inspect and just work out which ones if any need a little bit more desoldering there's one there that looks like it needs doing still and inspecting from the top side here, I can see that, can you see that, it's fairly loose on one side but uh, not all the way around, we've still got something around here but a little bit of wobbling like this can help yeah we're nearly there now, I've freed up some more of the solder here oh, I think we're there, let's just hope we don't get any broken pads one or two stuck here. Yeah, no traces come off yet, I don't think. It's just this bottom end there. I mean, what you can do, it's the same thing I've shown lots of times before as well, you can move the socket here a little bit and see if you can work out which pins aren't moving on this side. Most of the, those have come through. I think it's one or two of these here, actually. Let's just see if I can just snap that one off there. Yeah, it was that one. And that's just pretty much freed it up. It's, uh, can you see that? It's coming off, look. Hopefully there's no traces coming with it. No, it was just the pin holding on. So, as you can see, no damage to the PCB. Uh, I just need to get a new socket on there now. So luckily I ordered a batch of these a while back when I was doing the other 500 boards. Um, so the pin 1 marking goes down there. On this socket here, can you see there's a little arrow there. Um, is there any other indicator there? No, there isn't. Yeah, so I think that should be okay. So we just need to search carefully, get that in place. Uh, flip it over. So just quickly solder a couple of uh, diagonally opposite uh, pins. So we'll do that one. Push on it from the other side. To make sure it's flat as possible, which it is. Yeah, flip it over, make sure it's as flat and flush as possible. That looks okay. Uh, yeah, and just solder the remaining pins. So there we go, there's our socket soldered on. I need to clean off the flux, yeah. Uh, I've brushed it just to make sure there's no uh, solder particles short or anything, but we'll get the Agnes back in there and go and give that a try. I don't think it's going to solve the problem completely, I think we're still going to have a black screen, but you never know, it might uh, it might do. And I wouldn't want to leave it as it was, because it was the only thing that's kind of wrong with this board, really. And after I've cleaned up underneath, you'd never know I'd swapped it out. So that didn't solve it, we've still got a black screen there. I think the next thing I'm going to do is the 244s actually in the data path. I'm just going to socket those up and uh, and just try those. Because I think it's going to be something like that. I mean, I could spend time scoping things. I don't see any point. Um, because all it's going to do, uh, really, is point me back in the direction of the data path. If I see anything wrong with the data bus, you know, nothing's getting hot. That's the thing, you know, there are no clues with this. There's no other marks or anything on the PCB here. So... Yeah, I think ultimately I'm going to end up swapping the data path stuff. The other thing is, the Gary is in a socket, let me show you. Yeah, I'm not sure if I've talked about this already but, or not, but 
it's in a turn pin socket in the original socket now I've taken this all out and inspected it all there's no damage or anything there I think that's just been done to get a better tighter fit but I mean it's been reseated two or three times there I know the Gary's okay there's no I don't see any damage so I don't think that's the problem I think ultimately I would swap the socket underneath there and just solder the turn pin socket straight on might do that but these are what I'm going to focus on next maybe the 373s could cause an issue there because if they're outputting at the wrong time as well that could cause a problem um, but the 244s I think are you know, more probable well this is where scoping might have been useful but bit 11 let me show you, I've been going around these uh, the data pins here so got, hang on, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 well I mean it might not be D11, I can't remember the pin ordering but anyway that 11th bit up um, there is no connectivity here if I go along all this side here nothing and it's the same on that side so I mean that would explain it entirely you've got a missing uh, data bit to the ROM it's not going to be able to boot properly um, and that does seem to be what's happening because connecting the keyboard up there's no LED on the keyboard it's not even lighting to indicate a fault that shows it's failed very early on into the boot process um, so yeah, I should have slowed down a bit instead of focusing on the data path stuff, but you know what, it's always handy to have this socketed. Um, so I'm going to have a look at the uh, ROM pin out for this and just work out where uh, D11, well the 11th bit pin from there, you know, goes. Um, and just double check that that's uh, supposed to be connected, but I'm pretty sure it is. So as I say, this is perhaps somewhere where I should have started. But I've just been testing connectivity, we found one data bit uh, that was not connected. I think I might have just wired up the one that was connected, and that might be why it's still not working. But I also then went to the address bus, because it still wasn't working, and found an address bus. I think it was A7 or A8, somewhere up here, wasn't connected either. Um, so I've connected that, but just let me just show you. Um, sorry, you couldn't see the probe there. Can you see, th these are data pins. The first five here, let me just show you, I'll show you this side first. So we've got, I think it goes D1, D sorry, D0, D1, D2, D3, D4, so you can see some, you know, highs, lows, pulsing, etc. And then just watch this side here, so this is like D5 or D, I think it's D5, because it starts at D0. D6, D7, D8, D9, D10, D11. Why is D11 flowing? And I think it's reading. It's trying to read here from the ROM, and uh, we've got a floating pin. So it's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seventh one up here needs to connect to the relevant place on the ROM. Well, this has proven to be quite challenging. Um, so after sorting out the data and address bus issues, uh, we've got an output problem, an output enable problem. Can you see here? It's floating. I've traced it all the way from pin 24 on the Gary to this via here, at the moment it's high, but I have a recycle of power. I'm going to try and reach, hang on. It will probably uh, pulse. Yeah, do you see that pulsing? Got a green screen at the moment. Um, so, I mean, we could have a ram fall on this as well, but yeah, yeah, that pin there, if you push it, you can see pressing in, I have now got a signal. Let me try and cycle the power again. Yeah, and it goes dark grey, light grey, and then kind of hangs. So we've still got something else loose somewhere else. I think it's these single wipe sockets. I think they're awful. So the next thing we're going to do is swap the, uh, the socket here, actually. And I'll test whether those two wires are needed, because it, you know, it might just be that this socket is bad. That could be the source of the problems here. But as you can see, we're getting a white screen up. But let me just cycle the power. You will see now, hang on a sec, it kind of look like that's normal but then it sticks here so I've se I think I've seen it before when you get a ram fault so maybe we've got a ram fault on this board as well maybe that's the issue here but in the first instance I need to uh, replace that socket so yeah I am enjoying this one despite the uh, twists and turns here you can see I just temporarily put this yellow wire I wouldn't have left it like that that one was more permanent but I suspect when we replace this socket this wire and this wire may no longer be required you can see I reinstated the two factory mods there those I'm not sure why someone took them off they might have thought there was a bodge mod or something you can see I cleaned off all the flux uh, from around uh, all that stuff there so that's all looking nice and tidy now so as soon as I get up to temperature we'll remove that and uh, get a new socket on do you know, one thing I'm just thinking, actually, I could have tested these wires. Let me just get the multimeter now. Because if there's a join between here and here, you don't need the wire. 
And I didn't do that. I was measuring from the top of the socket. A measuring from the top of the socket is not the same as measuring from soldered points. So, yeah, can you see we've got a join there? So let's just remove this one. I reckon this one will be joined as well. I think it's the socket that's the issue. I mean, whether that's going to uh, allow it to boot, you know, whether there's another fault remains to be seen. Because we've already found a faulty... Yeah, that one's joined as well. We've already found one faulty CIA. You saw it hanging on the sort of grey screen there, which uh, kind of leads me to think that there's another fo problem with this as well. It's one of these with multiple small issues. You know, I mean, right from the start here, the factory mods, it wouldn't probably work right without those. So what I would say is this uh, board has been a joy to work with in the sense that the salt desoldering stuff is much easier than perhaps some of the later rev boards seems to be. I don't know, it seems to be a, a really nice high quality PCB this. Maybe because it's got single uh, wipe sockets, I'm finding them easier to remove the sockets. I don't know. Well, this is the first socket that's come off here. The Gary, um, I just uh, fit it back into the existing socket and it makes a reasonable, well, a very good fit. So, quite, uh, I should have took that chip out before I did that. It's going to come out inside the socket now, look. Um, yeah, there we go. No damage. You've got one pin come through. So, let's. Uh, get a new socket on there. I can just put, well the pin's fallen out, I was going to say I can pull it from the other side while heating but actually it's just fell out, there it is. So uh, as you can see no damage to the board there. Let's get our new socket into place. You might want to consider fitting a turn pin because uh, I do prefer turn pins. To they just make so much of a better grip to chips and if you've cut pins off uh, legs on things you know and if the legs have been cut down you know from you remove it from a soldered on uh, board well none of the biases are soldered on these so it's a, it's a mute point anyway but in chips in general um, yeah I will fit one of those sockets you know a turn pin generally just because the, when the legs have been chopped down as I say you make uh, you know they make a really good fit yeah, that's on OK, it's nice and straight, so we'll just solder the rest of the pins. So, did that make a difference? Yes, it did. But, it's still not booting up, and um, we're kind of hanging at that grey screen. So, yeah, I'm thinking RAM could be a polar issue, because I've seen sort of similar things like that on one or two of the 500s where you get that. And there is some corrosion around the uh, polar chip, actually. The main thing is we're making some positive progress, we are moving forward in a positive kind of way. So at the moment I've got the original data path chips and things back in, so I'm just going to uh, try swapping those over actually. I'll take the uh, 244s out first and swap over to some you know, good new, brand new 244s just to rule those out because we could have an issue there. So interestingly, despite being on, we're still getting nothing on the keyboard, which uh, shows again that it's crashed. Uh, you know, at another point early in the boot process, we're getting further, but we're not quite there yet. Um, I might just try it with an 8371 in case there's something strange about this board and this 8372. Yeah, testing with an 8371. We're getting six flashes on the power light here at the point when it's on the white screen, and then after it gets to the six one, it resets. One, two, three, four, five, six, reset. One, yep, that's doing it. So, so the question is, what are six flashes? I can't remember off the top of my head. I have to go and look that up. So, getting nowhere with this fast, actually. Um, I spent ages just checking things, checking out connectivity, measuring from the underside of the board to each of the pins to make sure the sockets are all good and everything's fine. Um, so I, I did some research, I couldn't find anything on six flashing power lights. It seems like there's a lack of information out there on um, the power light indicator. You know, because there isn't the keyboard, you know, I saw lots of things on forums going, oh well there's stuff about four flashes etc but not six. That's not what the person was referring to, the poster, like me, is referring to the power light flashing a number of times, because this indicates various faults as well, but there's no sort of definitive list 
that goes through each of the flashes. I think like if you get five flashes, someone said it was uh, missing or a problem with a tick signal, you know, related to the CIAs, um, timing stuff. So uh, with six, I couldn't find anything. So I thought, well, let's have a look to see if anyone's disassembled the Kickstarter wrong. 1.2 has been disassembled. Now, bear in mind, I'm not using 1.2. It's trying to understand the fundamentals because those won't change between, much between the revisions, certainly to do with the diagnostic stuff. So with six flashes, I found in the source code there, uh, I'll perhaps show you that in a minute, that it's an unrecoverable exception. Typically, when the uh, lower part of the stack is not working. So I thought, well, maybe it's somehow it's passing the RAM test. And I was looking at the way it RAM tests. It goes up in like 4K blocks. It looks like it doesn't test every single location, which it wouldn't be able to in such a short period of time. So I'm speculating that there's something going on with the stack here. Um, I mean, the other thoughts I had. Out, uh, chip selects for the CIAs. I thought, I wonder if it's doing the initial boot then when it comes to enable the, the CIA over here maybe there's a problem occurring. And I, I spent some time with the logic probe checking things and I didn't see any activity on this one. So I tried it without that one and I tried another board without that one and you can get it to boot without that one in there. On this board you can't. But it still could be a problem with the chip selects and they come from the uh, 74 LS32 over here. Um, so I've kind of got that penciled in the back of my mind. Also the 74F74 here. This is something that doesn't appear, I don't think, on the other boards. So I don't know what this is doing on here. So, uh, And there's some solder, I can't quite show you, but on the expansion connector over there, there's a few bits of solder, and I wouldn't have checked that, looking to see if that might have be anything to do with it. But, I mean, we know all the chips on here are good, apart from, obviously, the RAM and the one or two TTL chips that are soldered on. But coming back to the RAM, I mean, I've tried uh, Logic here and I've tried uh, Diagram. I think this has got Diagram on it at the moment. And I'll show you what's happening. If I just pull that chip off, uh, hang on. Yeah, sorry for the light bloom at the top. But can you see we just get like a pink, purplish screen? Just all the time. That's all we get. Now, I could maybe connect this up to the ST again with the serial cable there to see if there's anything coming across there. But I'm speculating that it's the stack issue here. Could be wrong, but I'm speculating there's something wrong with the chip ROM. And uh, trying that piggyback approach, I tried with a kick a normal kickstart ROM to start with, and I was getting nowhere, it wasn't making any difference. But if I show you, if I put this uh, piggyback this chip over, uh, I've got a brand new working chip, well, not brand new, it's one I reclaimed on a previous video, uh, 41256 here, over the top of U20, and watch what happens. We don't get a pink screen, we get a yellow screen. And any other chip, if I piggyback this one over any other chip, that isn't what we see. So if I try the one next to it, you'll see it's just pink. And if I try that one before it, it's just pink. I've been over every single one of these chips piggybacking. And all I see is pink. But when we come to U20, and I piggyback that one again, I switch it on. It's yellow. Yellow every single time. So I'm going to remove U20 and socket it up. Because I've just got this suspicion based on that behaviour there. That U20 is the problem actually. Oh my god, I hit it first time. There we go. So it was bad RAM. This is the thing, you know, you might expect a green screen there, but if the lower part of that RAM sort of checks out as it's doing its, you know, jumping up between 4K blocks there, maybe not checking every single byte, it could miss faults there. And I think that's exactly what the issue was. So it's been running SysTest for a while there. I actually uh, fitted uh, half meg uh, slow RAM, you can see up there as well. Expansion, just to test that as well. So it's going through the whole lot, but you can see it's gone through, um, but you can see it's gone through 124 times there. No problems at all. So, I mean, I'll try a few games on this, but I think we can consider this repaired now. So I'll clean up the uh, flux from underneath where I replaced that RAM chip. Um, and I think we're all done. What I did to get this off is just use the desolder pump to remove uh, all the solder. There was still a bit of a solder attached on the top side, so I then just used hot air to free it up. So it's a 415, preheated around this whole area for I don't know, 20 or 30 seconds, and then just zoomed in about 30 seconds on each side, and the chip just came out, no problems at all, no damage. So there we go, that's all the flux removed. You can see where I've uh, done the desolder in here, you know, the pin, the board goes a little bit of a darker colour where you've had uh, the heat. Um, never noticed that on any of the other boards before. Might be just the uh, the fact it's an earlier board, but anyway, the solder points are all looking good on everything there. You know, um, no issues. 
at all. There's a few other things I will do. You can see previously somebody's got some solder on here, so yeah, I'm just going to um, get a bit of flux on there and just try and clean those up a bit. I mean, it, most of it's off there, you know, there is nothing to rub on anything there, but still. Um, it was uh, super amazing uh, just working out that chip there with the piggyback method. Bear in mind, like I say, all the diagnostics was not booting. Um, I think if we'd connected up uh, Chucky's diagram via serial, we would have seen error when we had that pink screen up or whatever it was there. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. The other thing I would point out, I think on the version of Chucky's diagram I've got now, I think is it 0.2, I think that's what I'm using, uh, it looks like he's doing more of an extensive RAM test, it takes a lot longer to run through, so uh, he may well have uh, fixed the um, you know address checks in there to check that you know the bits are being held at the relevant addresses correctly with respect to RAS and CAS. I'll get a little bit of glue under there just to stick that down. I've got some sort of rubbery stuff, some rubbery glue that sets really strong, it's really tough stuff. And I'll just squish a bit down there and then just flatten that, hold it down for a little bit until it dries and then uh, hopefully that'll hold in place. You could use double sided tape but it'll probably peel back up on something like that. Um, so I've got the original chips in place here. You know, I didn't need to replace any of these. That was a bit of a mistake but you know, when you start think, when you look at the behaviour we're getting here, it's something to rule out. Um, I'm surprised, I'm still surprised it ended up being this because I kind of expected that uh, Kickstart would have at least given us a green screen but no, it didn't. It gave us six flashes. Um, the the CIA that was up here was faulty. Uh, you can see here, the original one's got a D on it which maybe means defunct or something, I don't know. Um, or something similar because uh, I think the chap who sent this is Swedish, I think. Uh, is it from Denmark? I think it's from Denmark actually, Dan uh, Danish. So whilst I'm here, other differences, you know, the other thing that makes this a Rev 5, you know, you can tell, um, you've got the print here in the middle, that's an obvious one, but also the uh, crystal stuff is down here in the bottom corner instead of up here. The interesting thing is they've got a you know, position here, if you can see it says X1 for a crystal, so I'm not really sure why we ended up with it down here. Um, the 74F74 there, I think it's probably that is used for the clocks. The clocks seem to go in and out of that. So I'm not sure whether it's just something they just did away with and didn't need need it moving forward. Um, because the other boards have not got a 7474. They've got something else up here. It's, is it a 258? I think it is. Or something like that. So maybe they're just doing it subtly, a slightly different way, using a 258. Um, that's a flip-flop, by the way, 7474. Um, but that was one of the things I had in my mind, wondering if that was the issue or, you know, the thing with the chip selects on the CIAs, the uh, LS32 here. But, um, and there's not much else on there. If it hadn't been the RAM, it could only have been one of those things, really. I mean, I did wonder about these here, because this gets a bit warm. These are just for the serial, you know, one's a receiver, one's a tr transmitter, you know. Um, but I wondered if it was causing an interrupt on boot. I wonder if one of these was faulty, causing one of the CIAs to raise an interrupt. But I don't think it works that way. I think these are just past some of the other control signals to the CIAs. Yeah, and before I forget the other thing, obviously, you know, we had to do these mods here. These are factory mods, so why someone removed those, I don't know. They might have thought that that was something to do with the fault and that someone had been bodge fixing it or something, but no, those are supposed to be there. So when you want to clean the pins on these, when you've got these single wipe sockets, you'd think you need to clean this side. You don't. You need to clean this side because this is the side that makes the grip on the single edge. You see what I'm saying? You'll see in a minute. I'll show you on the socket. Um, I mean, this one's an exception because this Gary is going in the turn pin socket that goes into the dual wipe socket. Uh, technically, I should swap the uh, the sockets on the board. But I've just trimmed off the edges of the socket here. Can you see? I've made it totally smooth, and I smoothed it down with the iron, and then just used the knife there to clean up and sharpen the edges. So it looks nice and tidy. Um, but at some point, I will swap that socket. Uh, for the turn, I might even just fit the turn pin below. Remove the socket and fit the turn pin below. This is actually t this is actually two pieces of turn pin, as you can see. That's why they were a mess on the edge. But as you can see, I've managed to make that look nice and tidy there now. So anyway, let's just get this back in. I mean, this is an, a turn pin, so you clean the pins on both sides on this chip. But on any of the others here, the single wipe, you want to clean the insides. Yeah, there we go. So here's the ROM source code I was talking about earlier, you know, someone's disassembled it and uh, they've even put comments and things in here, it's fully commented which is really nice actually. Uh, and you can see this section here, I did a search for six times, six flashes, five flashes, I searched for all sorts of stuff, but eventually I found it on six times when I on the search there. 
This routine blinks the power light slowly six times and checks whether the user presses Dell on the terminal attached to the serial port. So if you were to connect up uh, some software, you know, to the PC, you know, use one of those Max 232 adapters, connect up to the serial port of the Amiga there, and if you press the Dell key, uh, I don't know what board rate it's but what it would be using, presumably a small like 9600 or something, 81. I assume if you press that Dell key, it would uh, jump into some sort of debug mode. It says it does a, a RAM, ROM whack, whatever that is. But then lower down here it says entry points for when the stack is not working. Stack pointer clobbered. Set the stack pointer to 256k and build a fake exception stack frame below it. So I think what happens is if you've got a problem with that stack there, you can't have a normal exception handling routine. It's, you can't do what it normally does, which is to give you either a guru or a coloured, you know, a particular coloured screen or whatever. At this point, it's just kind of unhandled. When your stack's gone, you've got major problems. Um, so this is where it falls into this routine, and then it's flashing the power light six times. So that's worth remembering that if you ever see six flashes like that on the power light it probably means there's something wrong with the stack area in your uh, system. I mean, it might, it could be all sorts of things. You could have a missing address bit connection. Um, but I would assume if you've got that far into the boot process, your data bus connections are probably going to be okay. It could be an address issue. But like it is in my case here, it was just one of the RAMs. Yeah, so thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for your support. And uh, hopefully I'll see you in another video very soon.